Chapter Two, Part Two of the Battle of Life. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Battle of Life by Charles Dickens, Chapter Two, Part Two. My story passes to a quiet little study, where on that same night the sisters and the hale old doctor sat by a cheerful fireside. Grace was working at her needle. Marion read aloud from a book before her. The doctor, in his dressing-gown and slippers, with his feet spread out upon the warm rug, leaned back in his easy-chair, and listened to the book, and looked upon his daughters. They were very beautiful to look upon. Two better faces for a fireside never made a fireside bright and sacred. Something of the difference between them had been softened down in three years' time, and enthroned upon the clear brow of the younger sister, looking through her eyes, and thrilling in her voice, was the same earnest nature that her own motherless youth had ripened in the elder sister long ago. But she still appeared at once the lovelier and weaker of the two, still seemed to rest her head upon her sister's breast, and put her trust in her, and look into her eyes for counsel and reliance. Those loving eyes, so calm, serene, and cheerful, as of old. And being in her own home, read Marion from the book, her home made exquisitely dear by these remembrances, she now began to know that the great trial of her heart must soon come on, and could not be delayed. O oh, home, our comforter and friend when others fall away, to part with whom, at any step between the cradle and the grave. Marion, my love, said Grace. Why, puss, exclaimed her father. What's the matter? She put her hand upon the hand her sister stretched towards her, and read on, her voice still faltering and trembling, though she made an effort to command it, when thus interrupted. To part with whom, at any step between the cradle and the grave, is always sorrowful. O oh, home, so true to us, so often slighted in return! Be lenient to them that turn away from thee, and do not haunt their erring footsteps too reproachfully. Let no kind looks, no well-remembered smiles, be seen upon thy phantom face. Let no ray of affection, welcome, gentleness, forbearance, cordiality, shine from thy white head. Let no old loving word or tone rise up in judgment against thy deserter. But if thou canst look harshly and severely, do, in mercy to the penitent. Dear Marian, read no more to-night, said Grace, for she was weeping. I cannot, she replied, and closed the book. The words seem all on fire. The doctor was amused at this, and laughed as he patted her on the head. What? Overcome by a story-book? said Dr. Jedler. Print and paper! <laughs> well, well, it's all one. It's as rational to make a serious matter of print and paper as of anything else. But dry your eyes, love, dry your eyes. I dare say the heroine has got home again long ago, and made it up all round. And if she hasn't, a real home is only four walls, and a fictitious one, mere rags and ink. What's the matter now? It's only me, mister, said Clemency, putting in her head at the door. And what's the matter with you? said the doctor. Oh, bless you, nothing ain't the matter with me, returned Clemency, and truly, too, to judge from her well-soaped face, in which there gleamed as usual the very soul of good humour, which, ungainly as she was, made her quite engaging. Abrasions on the elbows are not generally understood, it is true, to range within that class of personal charms called beauty spots. But it is better, going through the world, to have the arms chafed in that narrow passage than the temper. And Clemency's was sound and whole as any beauty's in the land. "'Nothing ain't the matter with me,' said Clemency, entering. "'But come a little closer, mister.' The doctor, in some astonishment, complied with this invitation. 
"'You said I wasn't to give you one before them, you know,' said Clemency. A novice in the family might have supposed, from her extraordinary ogling as she said it, as well as from a singular rapture or ecstasy which pervaded her elbows, as if she were embracing herself, that one, in its most favourable interpretation, meant a chaste salute. Indeed, the doctor himself seemed alarmed for the moment, but quickly regained his composure, as Clemency, having had recourse to both her pockets, beginning with the right one, going away to the wrong one, and afterwards coming back to the right one again, produced a letter from the post-office. "'Britain was riding by on an errand,' she chuckled, handing it to the doctor, "'and see the mail come in, and waited for it. There's A. H. in the corner. Mr. Alfred's on his journey home, I bet. We shall have a wedding in the house. There was two spoons in my saucer this morning. Oh, luck! How slow he opens it! All this she delivered, by way of soliloquy, gradually rising higher and higher on tiptoe, in her impatience to hear the news, and making a corkscrew of her apron and a bottle of her mouth. At last, arriving at a climax of suspense, and seeing the doctor still engaged in the perusal of the letter, she came down flat upon the soles of her feet again, and cast her apron as a veil over her head, in a mute despair, and inability to bear it any longer. "'Here, girls!' cried the doctor. "'I can't help it. I never could keep a secret in my life. There are not many secrets, indeed, worth being kept in such a—' "'Well, never mind that. Alfred's coming home, my dears, directly.' "'Directly?' exclaimed Marion. "'What? The story-book is soon forgotten,' said the doctor, pinching her cheek. "'I thought the news would dry those tears. Yes. Let it be a surprise,' he says here. "'But I can't let it be a surprise. He must have a welcome.' "'Directly,' repeated Marion. "'Why, perhaps not what your impatience calls directly,' returned the doctor. "'But pretty soon, too. Let us see. Let us see. Today is Thursday, is it not? Then he promises to be here this day month.' "'This day month,' repeated Marion softly. "'A gay day and a holiday for us,' said the cheerful voice of her sister Grace, kissing her in congratulation. "'Long looked forward to, dearest, and come at last.' She answered with a smile, a mournful smile, but full of sisterly affection. As she looked at her sister's face, and listened to the quiet music of her voice, picturing the happiness of this return, her own face glowed with hope and joy. And with a something else, a something shining more and more through all the rest of its expression, for which I have no name. It was not exultation, triumph, proud enthusiasm. They are not so calmly shown. It was not love and gratitude alone, though love and gratitude were part of it. It emanated from no sordid thought, for sordid thoughts do not light up the brow, and hover on the lips, and move the spirit like a fluttered light, until the sympathetic figure trembles. Dr. Jedler, in spite of his system of philosophy, which he was continually contradicting and denying in practice, but more famous philosophers have done that, could not help having as much interest in the return of his old ward and pupil as if it had been a serious event. So he sat himself down in his easy-chair again, stretched out his slippered feet once more upon the rug, read the letter over and over a great many times, and talked it over more times still. "'Ah, the day was,' said the doctor, looking at the fire, "'when you and he, Grace, used to trot about arm in arm, in his holiday time, like a couple of walking dolls. You remember?' "'I remember,' she answered, with her pleasant laugh, and plying her needle busily. "'This day month, indeed,' mused the doctor. "'That hardly seems a twelve-month ago.' And where was my little Marion then? Never far from her sister, replied Marion cheerily, however little. Grace was everything to me, 
even when she was a young child herself. "'True, puss, true,' returned the doctor. "'She was a staid little woman, was Grace, and a wise housekeeper, and a busy, quiet, pleasant body, bearing with our humours and anticipating our wishes, and always ready to forget her own, even in those times. I never knew you positive or obstinate, Grace, my darling, even then, on any subject but one.' "'I am afraid I have changed sadly for the worse since,' laughed Grace, still busy at her work. "'What was that one, father?' "'Alfred, of course,' said the doctor. "'Nothing would serve you, but you must be called Alfred's wife. So we called you Alfred's wife, and you liked it better, I believe, odd as it seems now, than being called a duchess, if we could have made you one.' "'Indeed?' said Grace, placidly. "'Why, don't you remember?' inquired the doctor. "'I think I remember something of it,' she returned. "'But not much. It's so long ago.' And as she sat at work she hummed the burden of an old song which the doctor liked. "'Alfred will find a real wife soon,' she said, breaking off. "'And that will be a happy time indeed for all of us.' My three years' trust is nearly at an end, Marian. It has been a very easy one. I shall tell Alfred, when I give you back to him, that you have loved him dearly all the time, and that he has never once needed my good services. May I tell him so, love? Tell him, dear Grace, replied Marian, that there never was a trust so generously, nobly, steadfastly discharged and that I have loved you all the time, dearer and dearer every day, and, oh, how dearly now! Nay, said her cheerful sister, returning her embrace, I can scarcely tell him that. We will leave my deserts to Alfred's imagination. It will be liberal enough, dear Marian, like your own. With that she resumed the work she had for a moment laid down, when her sister spoke so fervently, and with it the old song the doctor liked to hear. And the doctor, still reposing in his easy-chair, with his slippered feet stretched out before him on the rug, listened to the tune and beat time on his knee with Alfred's letter, and looked at his two daughters, and thought that among the many trifles of the trifling world, these trifles were agreeable enough. Clemency Newcomb, in the meantime, having accomplished her mission and lingered in the room until she had made herself a party to the news, descended to the kitchen, where her co-adjutor, Mr. Britton, was regaling after supper, surrounded by such a plentiful collection of bright pot-lids, well-scoured saucepans, burnished dinner-covers, gleaming kettles, and other tokens of her industrious habits, arranged upon the walls and shelves, that he sat as in the centre of a hall of mirrors. The majority did not give forth very flattering portraits of him, certainly, nor were they by any means unanimous in their reflections, as some made him very long-faced, others very broad-faced, some tolerably well-looking, others vastly ill-looking, according to their several manners of reflecting, which were as various, in respect of one fact, as those of so many kinds of men. But they all agreed that in the midst of them sat— quite at his ease, an individual with a pipe in his mouth, and a jug of beer at his elbow, who nodded condescendingly to Clemency when she stationed herself at the same table. "'Well, Clemmy,' said Britton, "'how are you by this time? Ain't what's the news?' Clemency told him the news, which he received very graciously. A gracious change had come over Benjamin from head to foot. He was much broader, much redder, much more cheerful, and much jollier in all respects. It seemed as if his face had been tied up in a knot before, and was now untwisted and smoothed out. "'There'll be another job for Snitchy and Craggs, I suppose,' he observed, puffing slowly at his pipe. "'More witnessing for you and me, perhaps, Clemmy.' "'Lor!' replied his fair companion, with her favourite twist of her favourite joints. "'I wish it was me, Britain. "'Wish what was you?' "'A-going to be married,' said Clemency. 
Benjamin took his pipe out of his mouth and laughed heartily. Ho, 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 yes, you're a likely subject for that, he said. Poor Clem! Clemency, for her part, laughed as heartily as he, and seemed as much amused by the idea. Yes, she assented. I'm a likely subject for that, ain't I? You'll never be married, you know, said Mr. Britton, resuming his pipe. Don't you think I ever shall, though? said Clemency, in perfect good faith. Mr. Britton shook his head. Not a chance of it. Only think, said Clemency. Well, I suppose you mean to Britain one of these days, don't you? A question so abrupt, upon a subject so momentous, required consideration. After blowing out a great cloud of smoke, and looking at it with his head now on this side and now on that, as if it were actually the question, and he was surveying it in various aspects, Mr. Britton replied that he wasn't altogether clear about it, but, yes, he thought he might come to that at last. "'I wish her joy, whoever she may be,' cried Clemency. "'Oh, she'll have that,' said Benjamin. "'Safe enough.' "'But she wouldn't have led quite such a joyful life as she will lead.' "'And wouldn't have made quite such a sociable sort of husband as she will have,' said Clemency, spreading herself half over the table, and staring retrospectively at the candle, "'if it hadn't been for—not that I want to do it, for it were accidental, I'm sure. If it hadn't been for me, now would she, Britton?' "'Certainly not,' returned Mr. Britton, by this time in that high state of appreciation of his pipe— when a man can open his mouth but a very little way for speaking purposes, and sitting luxuriously immovable in his chair, can afford to turn only his eyes towards a companion, and that very passively and gravely. "'Oh, I'm greatly beholden to you, you know, Clem.' "'Lor, how nice that is to think of!' said Clemency. At the same time, bringing her thoughts as well as her sight to bear upon the candle-grease, and becoming abruptly reminiscent of its healing qualities as a balsam, she anointed her left elbow with a plentiful application of that remedy. "'You see, I have made a great many investigations of one sort and another in my time,' pursued Mr. Britton, with the profundity of a sage, "'having been always of an inquiring turn of mind, and I have read a good many books about the general rights of things and wrongs of things,' for I went into the literary line myself when I began life. "'Did you, though?' cried the admiring Clemency. "'Yes,' said Mr. Britton. "'I was hid for the best part of two years behind a bookstall, ready to fly out if anybody pocketed a volume, and after that I was light porter to a stay a mantua-maker, in which capacity I was employed to carry about, in oilskin baskets, nothing but deceptions, which soured my spirits and disturbed my confidence in human nature. And after that, I heard a world of discussions in this house, which soured my spirits fresh. And my opinion, after all, is that, as a safe and comfortable sweetener of the same, and as a pleasant guide through life, there's nothing like a nutmeg grater." Clemency was about to offer a suggestion, but he stopped her by anticipating it. Combined, he added gravely, with a thimble. Do as you would, you know, and search a hey, observed Clemency, folding her arms comfortably in her delight at this avowal, and patting her elbows. Such a short cut, ain't it? I'm not sure, said Mr. Britton that it's what would be considered good philosophy. I've my doubts about that, but it wears well, and saves a quantity of snarling, which the genuine article don't always. "'See how you used to go on once yourself, you know,' said Clemency. "'Ah,' said Mr. Britton, "'but the most extraordinary thing, Clemmy, is that I should live to be brought round through you.' That's the strange part of it. Through you. Why, I suppose you haven't so much as half an idea in your head. Clemency, without taking the least offence, shook it, 
and laughed and hugged herself and said, no, she didn't suppose she had. "'I'm pretty sure of it,' said Mr. Britton. "'Oh, I dare say you're right,' said Clemency. "'I don't pretend to none. I don't want any.' Benjamin took his pipe from his lips, and laughed till the tears ran down his face. "'What a natural you are, Clemmy!' <laughs> he said, shaking his head, with an infinite relish of the joke, and wiping his eyes. Clemency, without the smallest inclination to dispute it, did the like, and laughed as heartily as he. "'I can't help liking you,' said Mr. Britton. You're a regular good creature in your way, so shake hands, Clem. Whatever happens, I'll always take notice of you, and be a friend to you." "'Will you?' returned Clemency. "'Well, that's very good of you.' "'Yes, yes,' said Mr. Britton, giving her his pipe to knock the ashes out of it. "'I'll stand by you. Hark! That's a curious noise.' "'Noise!' repeated Clemency. A footstep outside. Somebody dropping from the wall, it sounded like, said Britton. Are they all abed upstairs? Yes, all abed by this time, she replied. Didn't you hear anything? No. They both listened, but heard nothing. I tell you what, said Benjamin, taking down a lantern. I'll have a look around before I go to bed myself, for satisfaction's sake. Undo the door while I light this, Clemmy. Clemency complied briskly, but observed as she did so that he would only have his walk for his pains, that it was all his fancy, and so forth. Mr. Britton said, very likely, but sallied out, nevertheless, armed with the poker, and casting the light of the lantern far and near in all directions. It's as quiet as a churchyard, said Clemency, looking after him. And almost as ghostly, too. Glancing back into the kitchen, she cried fearfully, as a light figure stole into her view. What's that? Hush, said Marion, in an agitated whisper. You have always loved me, have you not? Loved you, child. You may be sure I have. I am sure. And I may trust you, may I not? There is no one else just now in whom I can trust. Yes, said Clemency with all her heart. There is someone out there, pointing to the door, whom I must see and speak with tonight. Michael Warden, for God's sake, retire! Not now! Clemency started with surprise and trouble as, following the direction of the speaker's eyes, she saw a dark figure standing in the doorway. In another moment you may be discovered," said Marion. "'Not now. Wait, if you can, in some concealment. I will come presently.' He waved his hand to her, and was gone. "'Don't go to bed. Wait here for me,' said Marion, hurriedly. "'I have been seeking to speak to you for an hour past. Oh, be true to me!' Eagerly seizing her bewildered hand, and pressing it with both her own to her breast, an action more expressive, in its passion of entreaty, than the most eloquent appeal in words, Marion withdrew, as the light of the returning lantern flashed into the room. End of chapter 2, part 2